Hi there. Climate activists know how to make a scene. In recent weeks, they've either glued themselves to famous paintings or thrown food at them as a way to draw attention to global heating. But is anyone really getting the message? Just a day before the UN climate conference kicked off, two activists in Madrid glued themselves to Francisco de Goya's Maya paintings. It's one of the latest such protests that have intensified in recent weeks across the world, from the Netherlands and Australia to Italy and Germany. For the climate activists, it's all a way to pressure governments to cut greenhouse gas emissions and switch to a low-carbon economy. Climate researchers say if things keep going this way, the world's temperature could rise up to 2.9 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. That almost doubles the 1.5 degree rise targeted in the Paris Climate Agreement in 2016. But for activists, not enough people are alarmed, and their conventional protests don't make the headlines as much as vandalizing a Van Gogh. That's why they question what the value of art will be in the future if you can't even eat. But how effective is this messaging? Well, for the British activists who participated in the attack at London's National Gallery, it's worth trying. There have been messages of hate, of course, and there have been messages of support as well, because people realise that this is a proportionate act to a criminal government. The government's inaction is criminal. I'm not a criminal. I'm a scared little kid trying to fight for their future. But some London commuters aren't on the same page. I fully understand um, what they're looking to do, but I think that, that there's, there's a lack of realism in terms of what, what, they, can, what they can achieve. Um, you know, just stopping oil is, is a fantastic concept, so I absolutely get that. Um, but doing that, like they sort of say, in terms of overnight or over a week or a month, is, is, is just totally impractical. I think they are raising awareness, but they are doing it the wrong way. Uh, violence and uh, attracting the ire and the anger of the population is not the right way to make a cause um, sympathetic and appealing. She'd feel pleased to be part of it because art is supposed to elicit emotions. And that could happen because the activists have made it loud and clear they will continue such protests. That's why art historian Sally Hickson hopes they think twice. While she understands climate activism is dedicated to our shared fate, she says it was art that brought people together during the coronavirus pandemic. And she adds, if you're willing to fight for the protection of art, maybe you're willing to fight to protect the planet. It's been a hundred years since Tutankhamun's tomb was discovered. The find is a milestone in the field of archaeology. But in Orientalist fashion, the historic event also prompted Hollywood to come up with one of its most enduring movie villains. In our movie Almanac, Ali John explains. Death, eternal punishment. In 1922, the tomb of Pharaoh Tutankhamun was uncovered by the British. Its importance for ancient Egyptian studies aside, the find also had a huge impact on popular culture. And it all has to do with the death of George Herbert. He was among the excavation's patrons who died from a mosquito bite that was later infected by a razor cut. But the media blamed Herbert's demise on the mummy's wrath, and the legend of his curse was born. 
To coast off the buzz of that sensational headline, Hollywood got to work and in 1932 released The Mummy. You will not remember what I show you now. Not surprisingly, it tells the tale of a mummy coming back to life when archaeologists read a curse found in his tomb out loud. Played by Boris Karloff, the monster falls in love with Helen and wants the half-Egyptian woman to be her bride for eternity. Now, Miss Farley, help me to get dressed and get out of here. The Rotten Tomatoes website calls the picture a masterful template for mummy-themed films that followed. But despite the praise from horror fans, the flick still has its critics. What became of the mummy of Imhotep? They say it labels Eastern culture as the other. See, in The Mummy, the East is portrayed as primitive, especially compared to the West. The archaeologists in the movie are presented as cultured and knowledgeable, whereas the locals are depicted to be living according to their superstitions. The dark cinematography and the ghoulish villain brands Cairo as a dangerous city, and the costumes and decorations exoticize it. According to scholars, all this serves to build the mythification of the West as superior, and that Orientalist view is still present even in contemporary versions of the mummy, which in turn comes to show that its curse is still alive at least in Hollywood. The Met Museum has decided to pair Cubist art with older works depicting eye-deceiving illusionism. And its latest exhibition promises a dynamic play between the past and the present. Here's more. What do a music video, some paintings from the 17th century, and cubism have in common? The technique they use, trompe l'oeil. It literally means to deceive the eye. It's a highly realistic optical illusion of painting three-dimensional space and objects on a flat surface. According to the Met Museum's latest exhibition, cubists like Picasso actually both parodied and paid homage to the technique in their works. We've never seen his work in, in this way before. We've never understood uh, his dialogue. We, often we've seen exhibitions on Picasso and Cezanne, Picasso and Goya, Picasso and the Spanish tradition, even Picasso and still life, but not Picasso and trompe l'oeil, and the way that many of his humorous, intelligent and whimsical devices the way uh, he's playing with us and representation is part of this longer centuries uh, old tradition. The exhibition titled Cubism and the Trompe l'oeil Tradition presents a new understanding of the movement. It shows the strategies and motives of Cubism across more than 100 objects, from collages to still life and sculptures. The emphasis is how the artists play around with deceiving the eye. As, um, in particularly in the collage phase, once they introduced real material artifacts into the picture, like newspaper clippings and trompe l'oeil wallpapers, that this game of what is real and what is fake, of truth and falsehood, and of what is original and what is a copy, all come into play. It's serious fun. The Cubist artworks are paired with works by European and American artists from the 17th through the 19th century. Many characteristics thought to be specific to Cubism had already been explored in that era. The most common one is the invasion of the real world into the pictorial one. In some of the earlier paintings, they are reproducing actual simulacrum of documents. We know that. But they change the dates, they change words, they fiddle with it to give people the message, you better pay attention. You cannot believe what you read, and you cannot believe what you see. And that has tremendous um, relevance to today. 
The exhibition is also a part of the International Picasso Celebration to mark the 50th anniversary of the artist's death this year. And what better way to commemorate Picasso than by revealing yet another of the many intriguing facets of his opus? Alejandro González in Arutu won Oscars for Best Director two years in a row, but he was away from the screens for the last couple of years. That's because he was busy experiencing what he says is the most challenging filmmaking he's ever done. We had it all. You were a movie star, remember? Who is this guy? He used to be Birdman. Like Alejandro González Iñárritu took home the Best Director Oscar for Birdman in 2015, just a year before winning the same award for The Revenant. Then he had some time to focus on his roots, himself and his family. That's when Iñárritu created a conceptual virtual reality installation called Carnei Arena. It explores the human condition of immigrants and refugees based on true stories. And recently, he's returned to the screens with Bardo, false chronicle of a handful of truths. That's almost an amalgamation of his latest projects. Well, I think you cannot explain Bardo without Birdman and without Carne y Arena, which is this virtual reality installation that I did. Because in virtual, in Carne y Arena, basically the, the, the experiment, let's say, was to put the audience and the spectator in in kind of a ghostly form, like an invisible ghost. You become an invisible ghost that are witnessing a very terrifying experience of migrants crossing the border. Inyarato says it took him four years to write the script of Bardo. And even after its world premiere at the Venice Film Festival earlier this year, he still wasn't done. He ended up trimming 22 minutes of the flick right afterwards, just to make it tighter. The director told Hollywood Reporter the premiere was an opportunity to watch the movie with a large group of people and that those who saw the original probably won't realize the subtle changes. Bardo, false chronicle of a handful of truths, is still a two and a half hour film. The movie follows the surreal introspective journey of an acclaimed Mexican journalist and documentarian who lives in LA. It shows the character reconciling with the past the present and his identity while blending drama and comedy. Most importantly, what I wanted to do in Bardo is to laugh about it, so to make it, because humor is a very serious thing. Without humor, you cannot survive your life or history. So you have to, it's like oil in a cooking. So it's, it, there's something that, so humor is something that I think helps to understand more without being bitter. But humor, I think, reveals the truth a little bit more more profoundly, you know. Bardo hits the theaters on November 4th and then makes its way to Netflix on December 16th. And Inyarato hopes that audiences would understand the Mexican experience and their country's border history better once they see the movie. A statue of a horse's head at the British Museum was taken from the Greek Parthenon in the early 1800s. A robot has now carved a replica of the statue to convince the museum to return the artifact and display the copy instead. We chose the Celine horse because it's an object that, that most people know already. So it will help them when they see our, our reconstruction of it, since they already have a good idea in their minds of what this thing is supposed to look like when they see our object, I'm hoping that it will align with their memory of the object. They, 
they want these things for the same reason that the British treasure the crown jewels, that Americans treasure the Statue of Liberty. It's because this object is part of the, part of their history. It's part of their identity. It's part of the fabric of their of, the, of their of their history, and they want the objects back for the metaphysical value that they have, not for their appearance. So this was a win-win situation. We could provide the British Museum with reconstructions in many forms. They could be reconstructions of the objects as they appear today, or they could be reconstructions of these objects, color restored, fingers, toes, and arms restored as they appeared at the time they left Phidias's studio. Eighteenth-century French novel Dangerous Liaisons has been adapted multiple times, including a successful theater play and award-winning films. Now, a new movie adaptation brings this classic story of love, seduction and corruption to the halls of a high school in modern-day France. In the novel you have two very spoilt people destroying women for as a game. This is a very complex game but it, the stakes are huge and the stakes are very personal for each of them. I'm going to marry him. You can't trust him. I am obsessed with the memory of you. He's such a fool to wait for you while all the time she's waiting to. Not the same. There's a complexity, I think, that the show allows the characters that you don't get in the novel. Then I'll always remember. What? What I would otherwise choose to forget. No, you must learn to hide it. Because My love for you is the only thing I am sure of. Then what would you give to have me back? Everything. We were kind of working on this just before the whole Me Too, you know, movement broke. And But it's interesting because my slight, you know, reservations about coming to it was as a feminist how, how to love this destructive narcissist who's Valmon. And that was as, as key as discovering the way into Camille was the way into Valmon that, that meant that you can understand his behavior. Then let me prove it. I want a better life. Black Panther was held as a milestone for its depiction of Africa. Four years after its release, the follow-up Black Panther Wakanda Forever is being premiered worldwide. David Doyle has more. Cameras flickered at the London premiere of Black Panther Wakanda Forever on Thursday night. The film, set in the fictional African land of Wakanda, follows the first Black Panther, a global hit released in 2018. That movie was hailed as a milestone for racial diversity in Hollywood and in the depiction of Africa on the big screen. Kenyan-Mexican actor Lupita Nyong'o, who plays Nakia, said Black Panther was about celebrating diversity instead of homogeny. It's really an homage to so much that is indigenous to the continent. And um, we're celebrating our culture, we're celebrating um, where we're from in a way that's extremely inclusive, you know. But the Marvel blockbuster is not without its critics. One member of Nigeria's film industry, known as Nollywood, described it as an example of exploitation of Africa by Westerners to profit from their own idealized version of the continent. But Ayo Ayasimoju, a lecturer in media studies at Nigeria's Joseph Ayo Babalola University, said the film had at least disputed some stereotypes and opened up the space for conversations. I believe things can, you know, happen gradually, stage by stage. We're not where Martin Luther King left us as, as a black generation, as a black race, right? So things would continue to improve. Definitely, Black Panther was a turning point in black history, right? And will continue to grow on from there. He argued that Black Panther had provided a foundation for Africa's cinema industry and said he had expected to see more collaboration between African studios and those in countries like the US and Britain. You saw the excitement. It was without race, different people, different colors. We're all excited about the release of Black Panther, right? So I think it can again be that way with Wakanda forever, but these things are foundational blocks that other industries can build on. It doesn't have to be Marvel alone. Black Panther was 2018's top grossing movie in the United States and Canada, and second highest worldwide, with $1.3 billion in ticket sales.
Black Panther Wakanda Forever begins its global cinema rollout from November the 9th. Istanbul's contemporary culture institution SALT has turned the dial back to the 1990s and it's put the spotlight on the performance arts of the era. It might have bits of reminiscence about it, but as Ali John explains, the event is actually a reflective analysis of the decade. SALT's The 90s on Stage exhibition creates a mix of performance art that reflects on and defines the decade. And while it offers acclaimed traditional art pieces, there is still room for the unconventional. For example, SALT also labels 19's television a performance art in its own right. But at the end of the day, it's all about commentary, from routines of daily life to social hierarchy. And it all makes sense within the exhibition's context. But why look back on the 1990s in particular? And why look back on it now? SALT is a part of L'Internationale, the European Museums Confederation and other affiliates of the platform are also focusing on performance art in the 1990s. But when talking about what was going on specifically in Turkey at the time, we can say that the decade saw innovative artists use performance art as a way to express themselves. The 90s is also a decade that saw the emergence of the multidiscipline concept. Examples of installation, music and body-oriented performance art were in the limelight. The exhibition does put the 1990s under the magnifying glass. But make no mistake, what it offers is not a nostalgia trip. When you talk about the 1990s, especially with its popular culture products such as music videos, it's not easy to avoid the nostalgia. But we kept our stance in that. We didn't want to create an inauthentic sense of reminiscence. We want visitors to explore the 1990s in a way they haven't experienced it before. And that means organizers had to cherry-pick artworks to fit that memo. When choosing the works, we used a case-by-case -case methodology. The serotonin exhibitions came to mind immediately. Then we chose works from the Asos Performance Arts Festival because it turned the historically rich Assos region into an alternative performance stage. And to show visitors that the concept of stage embodies a wide spectrum, we also gave room to broadcasts of private channels from the 1990s, because they turned the television medium into a sort of performance art stage as well. So basically, we analysed each work individually. One featured art pieces by Mehmet Sander, Tate Britain calls him an action architect that brings new perspectives to performance art. And it's unusual in the sense that it excludes a performance component some might call vital, music. I wrote my manifesto when I was 23 years old. 23 years old. So my manifesto states that I need to uh, take out all unnecessary things like storytelling, emoting, so dance for me is just moments, space and time. My biggest problem with music is this, I'll tell you, uh, I can tell you like almost all choreographers, they try to fit movements in, into music and rhythm, so that's so limiting, you know, like the metronome, you know, that rules their work most of them. So when I was 22 years old, when I cancelled music completely as the biggest enemy of dance, and the reason I'm saying because enemy of dance because People are so caught up with trying to fit, fit movements into music, so they see movements in a very limited sense. So the moment I cancel music completely, it freed me for other, other uh, areas to be inspired, mainly architecture and physics. Sundar says the 1990s mostly had a movement for movement's sake credo, but it seems the introduction of the internet changed things for the stage just like it did for other art fields. I think because the media change, 
because of the social media, I think people are taking their sources from all over the place, if that makes sense. Like, whereas before the internet age, I think people would just focus on one, one thing at a time, you know? I think there's resources, not for me, but resources are infinite because of the internet. Do you know what I mean? Like, um, they can pick up their sources from 50s, 60s, and now a decade before. So I don't think there's any de defined, defined definition in terms of style anymore. So the SALT exhibit plays time capsule to that era of defined definitions that art lovers can enter until February 2023. Ali Pamir, TRT World, Istanbul. That's it for this episode of Showcase with me, Elif Bereketli. From me and the whole team here in Istanbul, thank you for watching and goodbye for now. Thank you.